Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us from around the world in different time zones. My name is Irini Albandi, and I'm the Executive Director at Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. I'm glad to welcome you to our Futures of Humanitarianism series. We designed this series to address pressing issues in the humanitarian field and create an open dialogue in an academic and scholarly setting for exploring big trends at the forefront of humanitarian research, education, and fieldwork. An additional goal for me when I was curating the series was to emphasize how different stakeholders, NGOs, UN agencies, governments, deal with humanitarian crisis and present their different perspectives being at the front line. Today, we have an exciting group of speakers who will talk about forced migration in Eastern Mediterranean. All three speakers are esteemed leaders and experts in their field, so I probably need the entire hour to do justice to their accomplishments. For the purposes of this talk, I will only give you a brief introduction so that we can move straight to the panel discussion. First, it's my honor to welcome Minister Notis Mitarachi from the Ministry of Migration and Asylum in Greece. During the Hellenic presidency of the Council of the European Union, first semester in 2014, he served as the president of the Council of the European Union in foreign affairs trade. In the period between 2012 to 2015, he served as deputy minister for economic development and competitiveness in Greece. In 2019, he was appointed as the deputy minister of labor and social affairs responsible for the social security and pension system. He also served as alternate governor in the board of governors of the World Bank and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and as governor in the Board of Governors of the Black Sea Trade and Development Bank. For me, as someone born and raised in Greece, it's a special honor to have you here with us today. Kalispera ke kalosirtate. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, Ms. Mireille Zirad has served as representative for the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR, in Greece since February 2021. Prior to taking up her assignment in Greece, she served as representative for UNHCR in Lebanon, Thailand, and South Sudan. Her career at UNHCR spans over 27 years and includes a range of functions, both at UNHCR headquarters in Geneva and in country operations on the Asian, African, European, and Middle Eastern continents. Ms. Zirad specializes in international protection and emergency humanitarian responses. Welcome. Bienvenue. Our third panelist, Mr. Gianluca Rocco, has been the Chief of International Organization for Migration Mission in Greece since 2017. He has 18 years of experience in the Southeast Europe region, and during his professional career, Mr. Rocco has worked on assisting different government institutions with capacity building and technical cooperation activities as well as on issues related to border management, refugees, asylum seekers, assisted voluntary return, counter-trafficking, de-radicalization, and migrant rights. Welcome. I would like to thank all three guest panelists for their time and sharing their experiences with us. Also to thank their offices and Sabrina Sarli from HHI for helping us coordinate this webinar. Uh, a little bit about the format of the talk. I will spend the next 25 minutes addressing questions to the three panelists, and then we will take questions from the audience for another 20 minutes. You may type your questions in the chat and we will do our best to cover most of the questions. Thank you again for joining us and I hope you enjoy the talk. Before I start with the questions I prepared for the panel, I would like to clarify that for the purpose of today's talk, we are mainly focusing on migrants, not refugees. The international legal framework governing migrants and refugees is different. And today we are primarily addressing forced migration. So uh, I will start with Minister Mitarachi. Tell us a little bit about the current context. What are the most pressing challenges in Greece as a European Union frontline country in the Eastern Mediterranean region now that we are facing an influx of migrants? Thank you, Irini, for your invitation and for your very kind introduction. As you know, Greece has faced enormous pressure since 2015. More than 10% of our population, an amount of equal in 10% of our population, came through Greece 2000, since 2015. A million plus people came through Greece, causing an enormous pressure in the five islands, which have been the islands of first reception, but throughout the country. Last year, we were hosting 92,000 asylum seekers and migrants in 121 locations 
throughout Greece and in four and a half thousand apartments. So migration for us is a big challenge. The case of Greece is interesting because we are not neighboring conflict zones. So most of the people coming to Greece will not qualify as we call them forced migration. The people that try to come to the European Union through Greece, departing from safe countries, although many of them may have had um, have been subject to difficult conditions in their original country. Having said that, we need to have a more active stance with regard to migration. I do not think that Europe needs to become a closed Europe. On the contrary, we need more people in Europe, but we should get more people through legal pathways. And in the cases of humanitarian crisis, like the one in Afghanistan, we should again allocate people throughout Europe in an organized way. And I'll close my initial remark with this one. We have accepted 100 female uh, dignitaries from Afghanistan recently, members of parliament, judges, uh, lawyers, advocates of civil liberties with their families, approximately 700 people in total. But we accepted these people cooperating with international organization in an organized way, and we're happy to do more than that. But we don't want smugglers to decide who comes to Europe. Thank you. Thank you for these opening remarks. And Ms. Zira, uh, Eastern Mediterranean is one of the most dangerous maritime migration routes worldwide. What are some of the recent policies or changes that UNHCR has introduced to improve the situation? Thank you. Um, well, the Eastern Mediterranean uh, uh, is a dangerous route, but as many other routes are, I would refer to the Bay of Bengal, the Atlantic route, uh, unfortunately, many lives are lost at sea. And I would like to recall here that, you know, no one chooses to leave a country, particularly a person in need of the fleeing war and persecution, you know, leave their country with, with uh, enthusiasm. I've never met a refugee in my life that was happy to leave this country. Um, people, remember that a number of people are fleeing for their lives and they are taking increasingly dangerous route and this is where I would echo the minister in terms of the legal pathway. It's very important that they are uh, uh, that access to protection is made available to uh, people fleeing uh, for their life and needing protection, so that uh, they do not resort to increasingly uh, a dangerous route. But when people have to save their life, they take enormous risks uh, for that. Um, what is important to say also is that. Uh, UNHCR will continue to advocate that for when people need protection, that they be heard uh, for their needs and, and they be received, that their trauma be addressed, the trauma that they have accumulated in their country of origin, but also along the road, this dangerous route that we were just referring to. Uh, once they arrive to safety, these mental health issues need to be addressed also, and that is very important. And finally, I would say that a solidarity among states is very important. There again, with the economy minister that it's important that when there is a crisis uh, all countries work together to work towards uh, a sharing responsibility in the case of europe there is one asylum system in europe and there has to be a shared responsibility also among countries to distribute numbers among themselves so that uh, everyone contributes to a, a resolution and to assistance to people in need thank you thank you and Mr. Rocco, we heard the minister, we had Mrs. Irar, and the minister mentioned 121 locations in Greece. You're actively now on one of the islands. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more, once the migrants arrive in Greece, what are some of the ways IOM is working to integrate migrants into the Greek society and or plan for their relocation to other countries within the European Union? Yes, I think that, uh, you know, I, uh... As concerned, the relocation is uh, it follows up what was was the initial the initial uh, thoughts of the minister. No, at a certain point in the context of of the EU, there are some specific entry points. I would say uh, the south of Europe is certainly with Greece, Spain, but also Malta. Uh, Italy is the main door for entering Europe. And the relocation is a mechanism to make sure that these countries that are on the front line don't bear the, the, all the old problems that are related with dealing with these massive flows. 
So the relocation is a way uh, in which countries inside the EU can, can share, I will not say the burden, but the responsibility of taking care of migrants when they come into the EU. Here in Greece, the relocation has produced very good effects. In, uh, in 2019, uh, almost 20,000 people were moved to other countries. And really, he made, he made the difference for a government like the Greek one at the time that was dealing with you know, thousands of people arriving every day, made the difference in the sense they could reallocate resources to, 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 to taking care of the new people that were arriving and, and at the same time, uh, avoid having the system of asylum getting uh, too busy with the high number of requests that they had. Uh, as concerned, the, the integration is, is a different part. It concerns those that have the right to stay in Greece. And uh, it becomes like the natural follow up to an emergency situation or to a high inflow of people. Those that have the right to stay, they have to be assisted. They have to be assisted in living in the societies, in understanding the values of the societies where they are coming, the understanding the principles that are guiding those societies. Failing in doing this, and we have many examples in the EU and outside uh, the EU, uh, will create problems to, to, to governments and societies. So the more you invest in integration, the less problems you have in later stage in trying to, 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 to merge these people that are coming from different backgrounds and different countries. Thank you. Thank you, all, all three. Um, I will briefly go back to what the minister mentioned about the current crisis in Afghanistan and see uh, if you can all uh, briefly tell us a little bit of what your organizations are doing to assist refugees and migrants from Afghanistan right now in, in the region. Thank you, Irini. First of all, let me say that Greece, as a member of the European Union, plays a very active role in a common European response in what it is a global crisis. We cannot relocate 38 million people to Europe. Obviously, we cannot take everybody out of Afghanistan and bring them into Europe. It's critically, and that is where UNHCR and IOM play a critical role with the financial support of the European Union and other major powers, is to help alleviate the pressure in Afghanistan to the extent possible with working with the current uh, regime there and also working with the countries in the neighborhood to provide safety for those that are really needed. On the others, on top, as I said, we are participating in voluntary relocation schemes for people in need and we're very happy that we're able to do so. We believe in the need to support. But at the same time, Europe has sent the message that we're not ready to repeat what happened in 2015. We cannot move uh, through illegal routes, hundreds of thousands or millions of people coming to the European Union. We need to make sure that we're able to provide support there. As I said at my opening remark, Europe is not directly neighboring Afghanistan. That doesn't mean we don't have a responsibility. We do have a responsibility. But we cannot allow smuggling networks to operate, take money from people to help them come illegal into the European Union. That's something that I think the unanimously the Council of the European Union was negative at the more latest meeting. Thank you. Ms. Girar from the UNHCR perspective. Thank you, Reni. Uh, as, uh, as you said, I think the, the, the priority for humanitarian agency for the United Nations and certainly for my organization is at the moment assistance inside Afghanistan. There is a major humanitarian crisis in the making in Afghanistan with 660,000 people displaced internally inside Afghanistan since the beginning of the year uh, and more to come. People are trying to return to their place of origin. Some are some new displacement is taking place. There is hunger in Afghanistan. The public services threaten to collapse with the support to Afghanistan uh, um, uh, diminishing. And therefore, we as humanitarian actors are more present even in Afghanistan than before to pre 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 try to prevent a, a major humanitarian crisis for the people in Afghanistan, but that will also have repercussion outside in the region. 
The second point for UNHCR as the refugee agency is to really plead for uh, continued and enhanced support to the countries in the region, Pakistan and Iran, that have been hosting the major uh, numbers of Afghan refugees for the past decades, uh, and but also Tajikistan, Uzbekistan and other countries, uh, to make sure that they can continue to support the, the, the people they already host, and if new people come, that they are also uh, uh, equipped and supported. We, uh, we do not see a ma major outflow out of Afghanistan at the moment, but this could happen and it's important to be prepared. There are still an increased number of people having arrived. We do not see increased arrivals in Europe at this point, uh, but there again, it's also important to be prepared and to discuss. We are advocating for borders to remain open in the neighboring countries of Afghanistan, because borders were immediately closed at, at the time of the crisis, advocating for people to be able to exercise their fundamental right to seek protection when they need it. And solidarity with the region around Afghanistan manifests itself not only in financial support, but there are also ways uh, of supporting the countries in the region by uh, offering resettlement quotas. So taking some of the numbers through legal pathways from the region into Europe or the United States or Australia and other countries. And finally, our plea for Europe is to really maintain the right of asylum for anyone knocking at the door in need of safety to show the solidarity and the generosity that is required in such circumstances and to uh, refrain from returning to Afghanistan at the moment, anyone that is in their country and maybe even rejected, a rejected asylum seeker, a person not found to be a refugee, should not be returned at this moment in Afghanistan. Largely, the European countries are respecting that uh, uh, at the moment, and we, we encourage all states to consider inclusively any person seeking asylum from Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Rocco? Yeah, following up on what uh, on what my colleague from UNHCR said, you know, at the moment the the major crisis is inside Afghanistan. Uh, the situation has certainly worsened. You know, IOM is there for a long time with an office, and lately, just for, to give you the idea, you know, ninety percent of the projects that we were managing were related to develop development, economic development. And now we are back on humanitarian programs in uh, providing food and shelter. Uh, there is uh, there is a high number of, of uh, you know displacement is becoming a, a real concern, and access to food is becoming a real concern. So we are we are we are back to where we were many many years ago, and this is where we are focusing now. Also. Obviously, we have also to, to, to discuss with the government on what can be done and what uh, which type of su support is, uh, is possible to be done. Uh, in the neighboring country, yes, we, we, we are there. There are, there are uh, already large numbers of Afghani. They are hosted mainly in, uh, in Iran and Pakistan. Uh, now, um, I, I, we have the same indications, there are no large movements to other countries and, and towards Europe. However, you know, is, uh, in this type of emergency that is not really related to a conflict, I think that we need to wait a bit more to see how the movements will settle. And that's why it's very important for all of us at all levels to be supportive to the countries that are hosting these people at the moment, and uh, and also to create the conditions for for the people that are fled uh, their country to return to Afghanistan. You know, in principle, nobody wants to leave his country; they would like to stay there. So, you know, if we if we work on that, I know it seems a bit like. A, a, a dream at this moment, but we should al already now start working on that, create the good conditions for them to, to, to return. 
Thank you. And perhaps following up on the Afghanistan crisis and the COVID-19 crisis. So in a few months, in January, February, it will be two years that we are all in COVID-19 pandemic, a global crisis within a crisis for all of us. So what have been some of the challenges for your organizations in dealing with COVID unique to the region and ways that you have uh, adapted or changed your activities to respond to COVID, for example, uh, receiving migrant populations and having to make sure to protect the populations from COVID. Mr. Rocco, I can start with you now. Yeah, COVID was, was uh, I think, a very, very interesting experience from which now we learn a lot. I hope that, uh, that we, we will stop learning, you know, because hopefully we are on the way out, but operationally for us as, as uh, you know, international organization dealing with emergency, it, it became very clear how valuable is the support of our staff. They are on the front line. They are those that cannot avoid being in camps or in shelters for unaccompanied children because, because of the COVID. And they have to take uh, uh, responsibility for what, what they're doing. And, and this requires you know, a, a, a certain type of attitude when you join an international organization. We saw, we were, I, I don't wanna say we were surprised, but we were pleased to see that all our colleagues were, were ready to take risks for what they believe and, and to try to assist migrants. I think the overall, you know, my concern or our concern is that COVID can become another reason for moving movements of people. The fact that if you count, you know, access to vaccination in Europe and outside Europe, or, you know, in, in developed countries against uh, other countries or African countries is, is uncomparable. So this disparity might bring people to, to the move because they want to have some, some, some uh, health uh, coverage or have some, some health treatment. So again, you know, if, if we continue thinking about our, our countries and ourselves, uh, at the end of the day, we, we, we have to take into account that more people might decide to come because, uh, because of these reasons. So I would like really uh, on this one, you know, that we all learn the lesson that we cannot just take care of, of our, our countries and, and build walls and, and uh, forget about those that are on the other side. Thank you. Ms. Zirar? Thank you very much. I think uh, you remember the, the motto, uh, no one is safe until everyone is safe. And I think uh, if the COVID taught us something is that exclusion kills. And uh, the challenge we faced uh, in Greece altogether, the three panelists here, but many more organizations involved in helping uh, in the refugee response and the migrant crisis response was uh, to try to keep people safe in conditions where they were sometimes in overcrowded conditions, keep physical distancing in, a, in an overcrowded camp. This is difficult. Uh, keep children educated in a place where, you know, people don't necessarily have access to Wi-Fi and can follow their classes. And with the restriction of movement, then children couldn't, of course, go to, to school. So there have been a number of challenges. We've tried to respond altogether by increasing the number of uh, liters of water, distributing protective equipment, sensitizing the refugees. And I would like to echo what Gianluca said about really the, 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 the efforts that all humanitarian workers de uh, deployed, but also the refugees and the migrants themselves. We also looked at you know, those who have a profile of healthcare, former nurses, former doctors, former pharmacists, and we involved them in dissemin disseminating messages of precaution, sensitizing the population in their own language with their own cultural sensitivities to try to disseminate. And I think the achievement is that we have not had a, a major outbreak of COVID uh, in, the, in the camps. Uh, some cases, some people were affected, but really uh, in, in, in general terms, there were uh, very few contamination in the camp. Now the next challenge is, of course, vaccination and what comes next in the next uh, COVID uh, in the future of the, of the pandemic. Uh, but at the moment, vaccination has 
has uh, started in the camp, we need to make sure it covers everyone, uh, including should there be new arrival in the future, that needs to continue. So these were a bit the challenges we face. So far, so good, but we're not out of the woods. Yeah. Thank you. And Minister Mitarashi? Obviously, for us, it was a big challenge. We were hosting 90,000 people at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, NGOs and international organizations were predicting that there would be massive loss of life in the camps, which did not materialize. We had a very organized effort. We created special arrival centers for new arrivals. We created protection areas within the camp. We trained and uh, help people with testing. We moved vulnerable people out of the islands into hotels in the, in the mainland, working with IOM and also working with UNHCR in many aspects. 40,000 people in the islands, zero loss of life since the beginning of the pandemic. In total, in the 90,000 population who had increased, we have recorded four losses of life. Of course, we had COVID incidents. Of course, COVID uh, affected people. And also, we had to make sacrifices. Uh, Mirel alluded to the sacrifice we made with education. C schools were closed. L local students had Wi-Fi at home. They could connect. The camp did not have Wi-Fi. We were not prepared for that. But now, with the help of the European Union, we're building brand new camps. The new camp in Samos is already operating. The camp in Cosenleros will open in a month. These camps will be ready not only to tackle the crisis with affect health, but also the implication of such crisis. Interesting point Gianluca mentioned, COVID may lead to a new wave of migration. That's a point we need to follow and we do follow. Thank you all. And it seems that COVID for all of us has been an example of how we can join forces and collaborate to at least reduce uh, or contain uh, the impact and the disease. Um, uh, my next question is um, for all three of you, and it's mainly about the human rights of migrants and the protection of migrants today is not what it was before. There have been many changes since the Universal Declaration in 1948. And even before the recent crisis in Afghanistan that we discussed, the region and Greece had received migrants from Afghanistan, Syria, and Bangladesh. So what does the future hold for protecting human rights of migrants in the region? I can start with the minister. Obviously, the EU is driven by the Charter of Fundamental Rights and the Geneva Convention for us, it's extremely critical. Uh, we need always to abide uh, by the strictest standards of human rights protection. Uh, also, we need to think about how the refugee crisis is evolving. And there's a lot of issues that need to be asked and resolved. There are issues within the European Union. For example, the countries of first reception are talking about solidarity within the European Union. We, we talk about one asylum system, but it's not. Every country in the end has to face the pressure from migratory flows, and that's not correct in a united Europe. We need to have a more open common protection space. I think uh, that's something that most people would agree to. But also we need to think about aspects of the, of the Geneva Convention. For example, the Geneva Convention says who is a refugee and who is not a refugee. There is international European legislation for that. If we can't return those not eligible for international protection in a safe and a dignified manner back home, and of course, offer them incentives to be able to go home, then the whole concept of offering international protection is being questioned by public opinion in many countries, because everyone very clearly believes about the need to protect refugees. But at the same time, we have to distinguish between refugees and illegally entered economic migrants which if they want to come to, the, to Europe or if they want to come to the European Union, they should be able to come, but not through violating our borders. Thank you. And Ms. Zirar, um, some comments on this and also perhaps on um, the what I mentioned earlier in my opening about refugees and migrants. Perhaps you have a, a perspective on that. Thank you. Yes, I think the, the, the minister very ably uh, uh, made that uh, that distinction. I think a refugee is a person who is fleeing his country because of persecution on the grounds of his religion, his political opinion, his ethnicity, uh, uh, these kind of causes for, for which he's being persecuted or is afraid of being persecuted in his country. Uh, and for that reason, refugees are protected in international law from forcible return to a country where their life or freedom could be at risk 
precisely because of their profile, even if they have crossed illegally the country, because they, they, they had a compelling reason to seek safety. So that's a bit the difference between, between those, those different categories of, of people. Now, I would like to say to your question, Irene, um, that say, despite the distinction, everyone needs to be treated with dignity and, and, and respect. So, and, and the international legal instruments are there for that. And you mentioned the 1948 declaration. Of course, there was the Refugee Convention in 1951 and a number of other you know, international conventions protecting the rights of people. In terms of forcible displacement, I must say that we have reached a peak we are now, I mean, the latest figures was 82 million point four forcibly displaced people on the planet, uh, including 26 million refugees. That means people that, have, that are displaced outside their country, the others being displaced inside their country. Um, the, 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 the reason for, for displacement are complex, they're intertwined, that includes also uh, a number of reasons. And unfortunately, this is not uh, abating. We don't see a reduction in this movement. It's becoming a fact of life. So it's very important that we as a collectivity of states organize ourselves to make sure we provide adequate responses to that. Um, uh, you have European law, you have international law, you have national law uh, regulating these, uh, these, uh, these rights, but also this shared responsibility. I would like to mention one recent initiative in terms of the evolution and how international law adjusted itself to an evolving situation. We have something, and Gianluca may mention the Global Compact on Migration, but there's a Global Compact on Refugee that was defined in 2018 by all the states of the world saying a massive refugee crisis is not the responsibility only of the states immediately receiving the refugees. It's, it's a shared responsibility. It's everyone's business. And every state in the world has to do something about it to help resolve this crisis in supporting the host countries, in taking numbers away from these countries, in working on peace building to resolve the, the, the war in the country of origin that created this movement. There are multiple ways of tackling a crisis. And the answer is collective action. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Rocco? Yeah, um, I would say, you know, more and more in the, in the, in the recent years, we are experiencing, you know, we are, we are dealing with mixed migration flows. So the flows are mixed. You have, you have refugees, you have economic migrants, and it's difficult to distinguish. Nevertheless, countries tend to simplify and to offer to all these people just the path to asylum. That is very clear and obvious to everybody. While there are other ways of giving protection to people, they are not necessarily uh, asylum seekers. So this creates a situation where you have asylum system that are overburdened. You know, in Greece, people were, were, were waiting until, until the, the, the recent, you know, uh, actions that were, were taken by the ministry, people were waiting for, for years before getting a, a, a decision. Uh, on the other side, you know, uh, countries in general, and, and we have a clear experience in the, in the EU, are, are not ready to define the legal path for migration. So in this situation, you know, we not having a clear transparent and credible policy for people to come to, to, to work or, or for different reasons into Europe creates a situation where uh, you know, uh, people tend to, to, to ask for asylum and to come in, in uh, asking protection for asylum. So this is creating a situation that, uh, that goes to the detriment of uh, the migrants themselves. Because, you know, when you have when you put everybody into, into the same pot, it gets difficult to, to provide the, the assistance and to define the vulnerabilities that you have in, this, in these groups. And on the other side, it doesn't serve the, the, the states they are receiving you know, or, or the, the, the European Union, because we do need uh, labor force in a certain way. 
And not having a, a, a clear policy on this uh, makes our societies, you know, give, give in, or puts them in the hands of traffickers, smugglers. We have a lot of people that are, they are forced to work on the black market because there are no legal pathways for them to come, to come, to do something that, that we need them to do. So I think that these two elements uh, make it difficult for, for, for countries in this, in this period to deal with the migra uh, mixed migration flows. Thank you. And I have a last question from my side, and then we can move to some of the questions on the Q&A. And I would like to follow up on something that all three of you mentioned about the forces, the drivers behind forced migration, and see in the next five, 10 years, what do you see being the major drivers for forced migration in Eastern Mediterranean? For example, you mentioned food insecurity, access to food, hunger. Uh, of course, conflict. Uh, is it climate change? We recently had a webinar here about climate change and how it impacts it, uh, internally displaced populations. So what would be your thoughts about the future? Uh, maybe we can start with Minister Mitarahi. Obviously, when we talk about Eastern Mediterranean, it's a very heterogeneous region. Some countries are members of the European Union, some countries are not. Uh, we have a long history in the region uh, for which regional cooperation is always the goal but are always very achievable. But when you talk about the trends in migration with regard to the region, uh, I'm not sure I agree with comments made that everyone leaving his country is not happy to do so. I think they, since we're talking about mixed migratory flows, we're talking about a lot of people that choose to come to Europe. And this is not negative. I mean, it actually shows that Europe has been very successfully in developing a model which has economic growth, social cohesion, democratic values, safety, human rights. We are a continent that wants, that attracts people. And for many people coming here and having their lives here and having their children edu educated in Europe may lead to a much better uh, life compared to if they were stayed at home. So a lot of the migratory flows coming to Europe are coming because they want to come to Europe. And I'm pleased that there are people that want to come to Europe. And I'll go back to what I was saying before about legal migration. A very, very few people are fleeing when they're coming to Europe. They might have fled originally, but I remind you what UNHCR says always, that asylum shopping is not part of the Geneva Convention. If you are at risk, you need to find the first safe space. You don't have a global travel card that allows you to choose any country in the world and any city in the world that you prefer to live in. This is a gross abuse of what re refugee legislation is meant to do. Ms. Iral, any thoughts or follow up on the comment? Just to clarify to, uh, to the minister, uh, when I said uh, people are not uh, uh, keen to leave their country, I was referring to refugees, people fleeing persecution. So um, that's where I made a distinction. Uh, I'm afraid that in terms of the, the reason for displacement, as you said, Irini, they are increasingly complex and, and, and that is not going to change. Uh, you mentioned uh, hunger, but there's also climate change issue. You said you had a round table on this. Um, if you take only that example, 90% of the refugees fleeing uh, persecution in their country are also coming from countries also affected by, by climate crisis. And 70% of internally displaced persons also uh, coming from such countries. So it tells you how intertwined the issues are, uh, um, uh, economic issues, political issues, uh, wars, uh, uh, everything is intertwined and, and needs to be dealt with with the uh, with uh, you know great analysis and, and thoughts to provide the adequate answers to the to the to the issues. Uh, our high commissioner in, in, in a recent uh, meeting at the Geneva level was saying uh, that um, he's, if these trends are not reversed, if we don't take collective action to address the root causes of issues and persecution and, and, and wars, his his worry is that it's not about. Uh, we're not speaking about when we will reach 100 million. I, I mentioned 82.4 million before. It's it's not 
about if, it's about when we will reach this 100 million. So that is a very serious issue and we need collective mobilization. As, as far as UNHCR is concerned, I would say, we would certainly see the future as you know, reinforcing the values that created the 1951 convention and all the human rights values they're based on because they, they are universal and they remain, they remain very valid these days more than, more than ever. And we should remind ourselves on this. I mentioned the Global Compact on Refugees, trying to find new ways of resolving complex crises by pulling ourselves together. If COVID has taught us something, is this. It's, it's by addressing issues collectively, we, we are more efficient. Um, in terms of European Union, we're speaking about Europe here because we're in Greece. Uh, um, international solidarity and responsibility sharing within Europe the pact for migration is showing interesting avenues for that. They deserve to be explored so that you know, frontline countries are not on their own dealing with the issue, but everyone is, is working on this. But certainly also reminding ourselves that building walls, xenophobic discourses, exclusion are not helpful in resolving crises. I would say, if you ask me, Irene, what is the future? How do we see humanitarian responses in the future or migra forced migration issues in the future? I think uh, they will be there and solidarity and care is the way to go about it. That's the, that should be the way forward. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Rocco? Yes. I mean, the future for, for, for this region and for Greece in particular, you know, Greece, Greece traditionally has always been the, the, the root of, of, for many migrants and is one of the, of the main entry points into, into Europe. This will not change, regardless if the situation in Afghanistan improves or in Syria, you know, uh, people can, can can start returning. Uh, this is the, the 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 route that migrants in in Asia, but also in Africa, are choosing to enter Europe, and this will continue. So you know, is is on us working in Greece, but uh, but also on Europe to understand that this will not finish. It will continue and we have to be prepared and we have to, to equip ourselves. You know, the, the, the fact that at the moment we have large groups of, uh, of uh, sub-Saharan nationals, they are coming to Greece. And if you were observing, you know, the, the, the flows comparing Libya and, uh, and uh, Greece, uh, you see that when when you know certain groups in, when it's easier to enter through Libya, they come to Libya. When it becomes difficult because of the local conditions, they move this way or they try to go to go via via Spain or the Spanish islands. So I think that uh, that uh, what we have we have to understand is as Europeans, I will say. Is that uh, you know we need we need to find ways to to manage migration. The management of migration includes border police, but cannot be done only with border police. The migration management is a combination of different elements, and if you're missing one of them, then the the, 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 the equation doesn't 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 have a, a good result. You know. So I think that you know is the right of, of countries to, to, to protect the, their borders, but uh, again, without a, a, a serious policy on, on legal migration, without uh, you know a policy that looks into processing asylum in in a certain period of time, uh, then then we will be difficult to manage the flows that will continue to arrive. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Uh, and I will move to some of the questions from the audience. It seems that three or four questions are exactly following up to what you just said, Mr. Rocco, about the management of migration and how the three organizations that we have here, how do you manage these conflicting priorities between safe, dignified, respectful manner and honoring the local EU legal framework in practice? And you can unmute yourself, you can pick, yeah. Okay, Minister, I, I, don't, I see you don't unmute yourself, so I start and then you please <laughs> jump in as well. I would say, I mean, the two are not incompatible. I think it was mentioned also uh, for, by the Minister earlier. 
the European uh, legal framework dealing with uh, you know, migration issues or issues of protection of border is also emphasizing human rights principle and protection. So the two are not incompatible. And I would echo what uh, Gianluca was saying. It's about taking all of the above into consideration. It's not mission impossible. It's possible. Many countries are doing it. There's no reason why you know, some countries would not do it. So I think it's possible by all countries. There are legal framework, national framework, European, when we consider European countries, and international uh, framework. And then it's about how to deal with people once they have entered and all the basic uh, rights that we were discussing earlier in terms of um, the basic necessities of life, having their claim uh, reviewed, having their papers in order, uh, etc. Integration once they are, when the status is clarified and they have the, the rights to stay in the country to, to start and move on with their life. So uh, they, they, start, uh, they start a life as a, as a regular stay in, in this country. Uh, all of this is important to, to take into account. So I would say there's absolutely no incompatibility. I think one aspect, the, 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 the border management or people's flow management without the protection dimension is, is incomplete. So the two are uh, working hand in hand. Thank you. Obviously, uh we need to make sure that we provide all the appropriate resources for people that are coming in our way. And Greece has invested tremendously in the last few years in providing a digital and accelerated asylum system. It is very important, I think that was the first thing I said when I took this role in January 2020, that it's very important that you're able to give a fair decision quickly so you don't keep people for long waiting in camps. So it's critical that the asylum service works fast. And last year, we issued 105,000 asylum decisions. The backlog is down to 40,000 pending decisions. That was almost 200,000 uh, two years ago. So we're almost at the end of the backlog. We're building the new camps, which provide respectable living conditions for asylum seekers and a good level of safety. And when I talk about safety, most of the violent incidents we've seen historically is within the community. So it's important to protect asylum seekers from differences that sometimes would occur within the camps. But also what is critical is that Europe works more efficiently with countries of origin and countries of transit to protect people where they are and prevent the need for people to have to flee uh, to come to Europe. We're talking about 85 million refugees globally. That, you said, Mirel, could become 100 million people pretty soon. Obviously, it is not possible to relocate 100 million people. So that creates what we call asylum roulette. So it is not necessarily the most vulnerable that are offered protection in Europe. It's actually those that manage, through the help of net smuggling networks, to make it to Europe. So we might be not providing help to those really, really need, but only among those that came to the European Union. Mr. Rocco, any comments on that question? Yeah, maybe maybe a few comments on the on the on the last point that uh, that the minister made. You know the 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 criminal networks and, and uh, the traffickers and smugglers, because this is an issue, you know, we are, we are, we are uh, witnessing for in all the regions of the world and uh, it gets uh, very difficult to tackle this issue. It's like, uh, you know, a, a, a huge octopus, you, 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 you cut one leg, but you have so many others that are, that are growing at the same time. And, uh, and uh, unfortunately, you know, is also an issue of cooperation. There is not always there between uh, police, between uh, between states and neighboring states, and and we witness all this because we see it on the on the migrants. You see it on uh, on uh, you know the families in the countries of origin that have to to invest all what they have, and then, uh, you know, to, to, to try to, 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 to move or to have uh, uh, some of their, of their migrants in that case, uh, moving to, to, towards a better life. 
and then he, he, he creates a whole situation where you know these these people that are arriving in our countries they on one side they are reluctant to re to return because they feel ashamed after they were investing so much to go back into their countries and on the other side they get trapped into having to repay certain criminal criminal networks so they are forced to accept jobs and uh, and to to work uh, illegally in our countries. So this is an issue that, you know, is, I understand is very difficult to tackle, but it's key if we want to, to promote, you know, a, a legal migration and to be able to, to assist the, those that really need assistance or, or, or deserve to be assisted. Thank you all. And I know we have a few minutes left. Usually I like to end with a note of hope and I see some of the questions uh, are not really on the legal framework or the government guidelines or what the convention says. It's really about uh, public perceptions, public opinions, social values. And one of the members of the audience puts it as, what can be done to keep the hearts of the people open to accepting those in need? So it's more about the society and the public. And for us being an academic research organization, this is part of what we do. We're exploring, we are researching, what are the knowledge, perceptions, attitudes? How can we change policy? So what are some of your thoughts, uh, especially looking at the future in something hopeful? Irene, if I can go first. Uh, yes. I think what is critical is that you need to persuade public opinion that people arriving are really people fleeing and the people in need. We've, we've done a poll in Greece some time ago, and we asked people, would you accept refugees? And most people said yes. When you ask them wh whether you'd accept illegal arrivals, most people said no. So the problem is persuading our public opinion that those arriving are really genuine refugees, and they're not coming as part of mixed laws. And this is important to make sure that we're able to return those that are not coming in a regular way to give more emphasis to those in need. If I can just say one more word, I was looking at the chat. There is a very interesting point. There's a question, what went wrong uh, or not right at the international level for allowing this increase of the number of refugees? And the answer is political, but it's an, I think it's a big topic for discussion. It is global imbalances. And there are differences in the political situation in the human rights regimes in many countries. And international cooperation plays a role but fortunately or unfortunately, there is a limit to the ability of the so-called developed world to intervene. And you've seen the attempt that we had in Afghanistan after 20 years, it didn't work. So the ability of imposing our political system to other countries is not acceptable. But at the same, this is not something we accept. Every country has a full right of self-determination and this is a basic right for every people. But unfortunately, we see many countries creating conditions or ending up with conditions that lead to refugees. And that's a very difficult issue to resolve. And Ms. Zirar, if you would like to answer this question or if another question from the chat uh, you find more relevant, feel free to uh, participate. I mean, I would, on, on the chat, I will uh, rely on your able uh, uh, good offices because I've not, uh, I've not had the time to read everything that was coming in as I was responding. But uh, I think uh, persuading people to open their hearts, I would say it's about telling the stories. It's really about telling the stories. There are, there are people behind these numbers. People hear about numbers. Sometimes there is fear mongering, you know, uh, uh, worries now the afghan crisis is creating this this phobia inside europe that uh, you know europe may be invaded that may change the demographic balance of them well we don't have any arrival yet so so and we may not have any uh, you know arrival by by foot and, and 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 just have the evacuation for now this is what we have i would i would say uh, listening to the story behind uh, behind every number it's not about statistics uh, we hear the story we as humanitarian you as academic institution the, the the ministry of migration we hear the story they the interviews of people every day and and the stories are horrendous you wouldn't wish to anyone to go through what one single person is telling us uh, they have gone through um 
that creates empathy when when you realize and and i must say also there are some very important gestures of solidarity by the refugees themselves we've seen in greece for example there was last winter uh, mudslide at some point there were fires this summer first thing you see refugees mobilizing themselves to try to support the municipalities that were affected because they were saying we were given a chance it's it, it's only fair that we try to contribute everything we can in the response in maybe cutting the dead wood etc to to try to uh, reforest an area or, or, or prevent that slide so uh, you know hearing the voices showing the stories you as an academic institution you can also contribute to disseminating uh, the reason why people are fleeing and the skills and the talents and the energy and the goodwill uh, they are ready to deploy to a country that is offering them a second chance. Best proof of that is the result at school. When a child who has been out of school for a year or two because of the displacement, because of a war, um, because the family was hiding, um, they, they are given the chance to go back to a, a formal school. You see, I mean, I was in Lebanon before being in Greece, and I can tell you every year, among the top results of the university exam, you could see some Syrian refugees in there. They got a chance and they maximize it. So um, giving a chance to people and it will, it, will, uh, it will produce result by itself. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Rocco, any closing remark? Uh, I think that, you know, that we, we, we have to, to understand that there is a limit on how, uh, how long a heart can, be, can stay open, you know? Because I saw, I saw it in Greece, you know, people welcoming the migrants, people hosting the migrants in their in their houses, giving their food, their you know water, shelter. When when at the beginning of the crisis there was not much that was organized, and uh, but this has a limit, you know. If if we don't manage these flows and we leave it to the people, then we just fuel uh, xenophobia and, and we bring communities apart. We have clear examples in major capitals in Europe where you know, the fact that we were, we were leaving the people by themselves and after, after assisting, supporting, but not in an organized manner, we, we, we left them alone. And now you have part of cities that are out of control. We have communities that live like, like in different countries. So this is, this is the risk, you know, to count too much on the, on the good heart of the people. If we don't follow up with, with a system and people see that, that there is a system for taking care of these people, then we, we, we experience, uh, you know, people that will not be able to integrate. We experience uh, criminality because there is no other way for them to access you know, uh, food and to, to, to get money and to find the job. So we, we, we need to make sure that the good heart is complemented by a mechanism that will take care of these people. Great, thank you for the last point. And I know we have more questions on the chat, but we are out of time. I would like to thank all three panelists. This has been a great engaging discussion. I'm sure we can have a full day and we can still be talking. Uh, thank you again. Thank you to our audience for, uh, for co contributing with your questions. Thank you again. It has been a pleasure to host you and we will stay connected. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.